It's been 10 years since 24-year-old Marilyn Bergeron left her parents' home in Quebec City and never returned. Today, her family and their supporters released new information, an image and reward money. They hope it will finally help give them the answers they need. The strange disappearance of Marilyn Bergeron. It was a quiet Sunday morning when Marilyn Bergeron disappeared so suddenly. One moment she was there, going about her daily routine, and the next, she was gone. The police were called, a search was launched, and the whole town was on edge. But despite their efforts, Marilyn seemed to have completely evaporated. As the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months, rumors began to swirl. Some said she had run away, while others whispered about foul play. The police investigated every lead, but the trail had gone cold. Marilyn's family and friends were left with nothing but questions and a gnawing sense of unease. Years passed, and the case remained unsolved. But the mystery of Marilyn's disappearance continued to haunt the town, a constant reminder that danger could lurk around every corner. As we delve deeper into the story, we'll uncover a web of secrets and intrigue that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Get ready for a journey into the heart of darkness, where the truth may be stranger than anything we could imagine. Marilyn Bergeron was born on December 21st, 1983, in the city of Chicoutimi, which is located in the province of Quebec, Canada. She was fluent in French, English, and Spanish, and had a love for a variety of musical genres as well as other cultures and languages. Marilyn is a graduate in Cégep de Jonquois, where she studied media arts and technology and received her degree. Her aspiration was to one day work as a flight attendant in Western Canada, which was also one of her goals. In 2005, she uprooted her life and moved to Montreal. Marilyn was employed at Steve's Music Shop and also did sound editing for the regional television stations as a freelancer. Around this time, she had been attending classes at the Industrial Alliance to improve her financial skills. In 2008, Marilyn began telling her family that she didn't feel comfortable living in Montreal and that she wanted to relocate back to Quebec City instead. She refused to explain to either her mother, Andre Bacard, or her sister, Nathalie, why she was suddenly overcome with anxiety, although she did say that she would do so once she had left Montreal. Marilyn's departure from her Oshilaga Mission where residence on February 10th was followed by her arrival in Quebec City. Over a period of five days, Marilyn and her parents made the trip back to her apartment in Montreal to get the remainder of her things before heading back to her own residence the next day. Both Marilyn's mother and sister made many attempts to speak to her about what could be hurting her, but she wouldn't engage in conversation. She said that it had nothing to do with drugs, relationships, or financial obligations, but she refused to provide any more details. At one point, Marilyn burst into tears and told them she didn't want to go back to Montreal, even though she had said it many times. She informed her family that she was going to go for a walk and that she'd be returning within a few hours on the morning of February 17th, a day after she had moved into her parents' house. This was the day after she had moved in. Just a credit card was on her person as she left. Marilyn may be seen on video security footage in Loretteville using an ATM just after 11 o'clock in the morning, but her attempt to withdraw 60 Canadian dollars was unsuccessful. Notable is the fact that Marilyn is seen walking about with a black bag behind her back, which she did not take with her when she left the house. She used her credit card to purchase a cup of coffee at the Café Depot in St. Romuald at the precise time of 14.03 in the afternoon. When some time had passed, the clerk saw that she gave off the impression of being unhappy and was eager to leave the situation. The last time Marilyn was seen in public was at this event, and her credit card had not been used at any point since then. In the latter hours of that day, Marilyn's relatives made the complaint that she was missing. They suspect that she either caught a ride or was driven to a coffee shop by a friend or acquaintance due to the distance of around 15 kilometers between her house and the establishment. In addition to this, it has been speculated that she was glancing out the window at a person she knew who was parked outside as she was using the ATM. The authorities have issued an appeal to anybody who have been able to provide her with the transportation on that day to come forward. Claude Poyeux, an investigative journalist from Canada, devoted an episode of his television show, Poyeux en Quête, to Marilyn. When it was shown in 2010, a guy named Poyeux said that he had seen Marilyn more than thrice in the preceding year in the town of Hawkesbury, which is located in Ontario, just across the Ottawa River from Quebec. 
He thinks that she relocated there with a young guy that she was seeing at the time. Throughout the course of the investigation into the tip, the investigators found that numerous frequent customers at the restaurant in the downtown area of Hawkesbury verified that Marilyn had been there one year after she went missing. There is reason to suspect she may have been seen in Hawkesbury, Ontario, which is located close to the border with Quebec. This information comes from a critical witness. A resident of Hawkesbury named Guy Salico said in front of the reporters on Friday at a press conference that he had phoned the police one year after she had been reported missing in order to report what he believed to have been an encounter with her. Bergeron's parents, Michael Bergeron and Andre Bechard, as well as their attorney Mark Bellamy, who served as Quebec's Minister of Justice and Attorney General in the early 2000s, were present when Salico met with them. According to Salico, he thinks that Marilyn knocked on the doorbell of his house at about 2 or 3 in the morning and asked for directions to Chamberlain Street in Hawkesbury in December of 2009. When she arrived at our home, she was shivering, she was weak, and she was drenched since it was pouring outdoors. According to him, she turned down his and his partner's offer to take her to her destination and after approximately 15 minutes, she departed. He adds that she left after refusing the offer. He described her attire as follows. A little jacket, blue trousers, a light white t-shirt with a v-neck and high-heeled shoes. He went on to say that she had blonde hair, seemed to be in her early 20s, spoke English well, didn't appear to have any kind of impairment and was quite courteous. She had brown hair and a tattoo of a horse on the right side of her breast before she vanished. The man claims that he had no idea who she was until the following days when he linked her with the circulating pictures of the missing Quebec girl and reported it to the police. According to Belmare, the information that he provided to the police was added to the over 20 credible reports that the authorities in Eastern Ontario received throughout 2009 and 2010 from persons who stated that they saw the missing lady. The attorney has said that he is of the opinion that there is sufficient evidence to suggest that Marilyn was still alive in the province of Ontario in the years after her disappearance in 2008. On the other hand, law enforcement officials chose not to attend Friday's news briefing and they also declined to comment on the investigation. They claim that the investigation is still underway, but other than that, we don't know anything further about it. We are in need of more. The parents of Bergeron are pleading with anybody else who may have seen their daughter in the years after she vanished to come forward with any information they may have. Her mother reportedly told reporters, I have hope. The attorney has expressed his hope that by disclosing Selico's statement to the media, it may encourage further witnesses to come forward. In 2017, at an earlier news conference on the investigation, 50 tips were sent to the police. If someone in Ontario has something to say but doesn't want to talk with police and wants to speak to their family or to me, it will be confidential, said Belmare. From the year 2010, members of Marilyn's family have submitted a number of petitions to the Ministry of Public Security of Quebec requesting that the investigation be transferred to the authority of either the Suède de Quebec or the Montreal Police Department. The SQ is often regarded as the most effective regulatory agency in all of Canada, and its authority extends over the whole of the province. The family feels that Marilyn's friends and acquaintances in Montreal may be of a great deal of assistance within the investigation. Thus, they have asked the Montreal Police to investigate more thoroughly within their jurisdiction. In addition to this, the family was upset that the police were treating the case as a matter of a disappearance and a suspected suicide, rather than investigating the possibility of criminal involvement, which should usually be a given in these investigations. In spite of their efforts, each and every one of their pleas was turned down. The family held a press conference in 2017 on the occasion of the ninth anniversary of Marilyn's disappearance, together with their attorney, Mark Balmer, who had previously worked for the Ministry of Justice in Quebec. They made the announcement that there would be a prize of 30,000 Canadian dollars for information as well as that Bell Mare would be putting a unique tip line for information. This line would be for anyone who had information but would rather talk in confidence to Bell Mare rather than to the police, as I previously mentioned. It began with more than 80 calls, 43 of which were sightings of Marilyn. Some months later, at a different conference, one of Marilyn's friends discussed the change in her demeanor that occurred just before she vanished. Jonathan Gauthier and Marilyn had previously crossed paths in college, and they got back in touch in Montreal in December of 2007. When he arrived at her flat, the first thing he observed was that she had altered her manner significantly. She didn't look like the cheery Marilyn he had remembered from before. Rather, she seemed sad. 
Despite this, they decided to attend a party. After catching up with a friend she had made at the party, she started to feel uneasy and begged to leave. As they got back to the flat, she immediately began weeping. Gorthia's anxiety led him to question her many times about whether or not she had been a victim or a witness to any kind of crime. She disputed both allegations and said that the situation was far worse than that, something that he was unable to fathom. Marilyn Bergeron has not been located as of yet, so many years later. If she's still living, she would be 35 years old at this point and would have a prominent Pegasus tattoo between her right breast and shoulder if she still had it. As we conclude this investigation into the strange disappearance of Marilyn Bergeron, the mystery remains unsolved yet again. Despite the efforts of investigators and the tireless search of her loved ones, the fate of Marilyn Bergeron continues to elude us. Thank you, the viewer, for joining us on this journey and we hope that this investigation has left you with a greater appreciation for the power of perseverance and the importance of seeking the truth. <laughs>